Hello, and welcome. My name is Andrew Graham Prague. I work as a lead application scientist for Spectral Instruments Imaging. And it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity today to talk with you about whole animal in vivo optical imaging. What we're going to do is focus on the scientific principles that make in vivo optical imaging possible. And then we'll review some of the more popular applications of in vivo optical imaging. Now, in general terms, in vivo optical imaging is a high sensitivity, high throughput screening, non-invasive imaging modality that is generally used for the purposes of monitoring disease progression and the efficacy of therapeutics in a wide array of animal model systems. In today's seminar, our agenda really is going to be as detailed here. We're going to look to see how in vivo optical imaging works, what are its key unique advantages as an imaging modality, and also what are some of its inherent limitations and how to work around these to optimize the in vivo optical imaging performance. And lastly, as mentioned, we will uh, present some of the diverse applications of this imaging modality as is used by the preclinical investigator. Now, there is a second seminar, which I'm not going to be presenting today, that dives down into the technical hardware um, specifics and capabilities. And this is a seminar that I would be glad to present to you um, and invite you to reach out and make a request. My contact information is provided at the end of this seminar. So in vivo optical imaging, how does it work? Well, when it's working well, this is what it can look like off to the left-hand side. We have a 25 by 25 centimeter square field of view in one of our spectral instruments imaging LAGO systems. And we are imaging 10 mice and capturing optical data from the five here on the, left -hand, on the right hand side. This optical data is basically the capture of light photons by the imaging camera system. And these light photons that are being generated can be generated in one of two ways by specific reagents that are added to the mouse model system. Optical data is generated in one of two ways generally, either by bioluminescence or fluorescence. Now, bioluminescence is the process by which some enzyme, typically a luciferase, and exemplified here is firefly luciferase, will act on its substrate, in this case, D-luciferin, in the presence of cellular ATP and oxygen and generate light. Fluorescence is a process of light emission that requires an initial excitation light source, exogenous to the animal, that will basically uh, shine excitation photons onto the molecular probe present. And this probe will have electrons that enter into an elevated uh, excitation state. And then when they relax, the released energy will um, be in, in the form of longer wavelength photons, the emitted light from the probe. And this will be captured by the camera system. So in essence, what you have is light generation by one of two methods, either by bioluminescence or fluorescence. And in each case, the emitted light uh, is uh, captured by a cool CCD camera system and then presented to the user for quantification. Now, how does one get the uh, probe in the mouse or rat model system? In other words, how does one get the moiety that produces the light, either by bioluminescence or fluorescence, into your mouse model? Well, there are essentially two ways to do this, either by genetic modification or by direct injection of the probe of interest. Now, I'm going to focus first on genetic modification. Now, there are two means for making these genetic modifications, either by transfection or transduction. With transfection, you are introducing new genetic material through a chemical or physical process. And with transduction, you are introducing the genetic material via a viral agent. All right, so there are many different kinds of cell transfection protocols, mechanisms. You can either do it through a variety of chemical carriers, leptosomes, micelle structures, et cetera. 
or you can um, do this through physical treatments, and they're listed here. Now, for viral transduction to happen, um, you either are going to use a viral particle that is in a lysogenic cycle phase or in a lytic phase, if you will. In, in the use of viral particles that are in a lysogenic phase, what you're doing basically is using the viral particle to add uh, viral, de uh, viral uh, genomic content to the content of the target cell population, be it a bacterium or a eukaryotic cell. And that uh, cell population will then replicate. And as they replicate, the viral uh, genome is replicated along with it. Now, in a, in a lytic phase model, the viral particle is essentially used to lyse the target cell by entering in the target cell using the replication machinery inside that cell and uh, eventually causing cell lysis and cell death. Now, there are different imaging applications that make use of each of these different ways of viral transduction. Viral lysogenic modification, in other words, the controlled addition of viral uh, genome to the target cell genome, uh, can be a very nice way to basically add a optical reporter gene to the target cell genome. And this is done many, for many different cell lines. So in this particular example scenario, we're looking at human lung carcinoma A549 cells that have been transduced by the Lente virus to express firefly luciferase. And these cells have been injected via tail vein. And of course, the first capillary bed that they come across is the lung. The um, 549 cells have been uh, basically enmeshed in the pulmonary capillary bed, and if uh, one injects the substrate of this uh, luciferase, you will get light produced by the luciferase, and that's being detected here and superimposed onto x-ray. All right. Now, for lytic viral particles, the application is notably different. Typically, what one is attempting to do is target and kill a specific cell population. And this has become a, uh, a very recent and popular application within oncology, where one uses a virolytic po um, uh, particle to go ahead and specifically attack a tumor cell line of interest, causing the cell death of the tumor. And uh, this is done and, and, and successfully because the cytosolic reality, both in a transcriptional and translational level, is unique within tumor cells versus normal cells. And in normal cells, the viral, uh, viral lytic particle is not able to successfully replicate, whereas in the tumor cell uh, environment, it is. And the secondary effect of these viral lytic particles beyond cell death for the target tumor cells um, is that you will get the release of a range of antigenic um, moieties presented here tumor-associated antigens, cellular damage, associated antigens, et cetera. And these components will basically activate both innate and acquired immune cell, um, cell types in the form of natural killer cells or cytotoxic uh, lymphocytes, leading to a very intense inflammatory immunogenic cell death. So there is a two-phase efficacy, if you will, to the virolytic particle in the removal of an unwanted cell line, such as uh, some, some form of tumor growth. Now, in this uh, example image on the left-hand side, we're simply uh, visualizing the first phase of this virolytic uh, phenomenon, where you have um, introduced uh, the gene for uh, GFP and Renella luciferase into a wild-type um, viral genome, and taking this modified genome and injecting it into the mouse after the mouse has already previously been challenged with a pancreatic carcinoma cell population in the upper right thigh, you can very nicely see that the uh, viral particles are successfully replicating in the tumor cells. And you have expression both of GFP for fluorescent detection and expression of the of renella luciferase, allowing for bioluminescence 
uh, signal production following usurper injection. Now, genetic modifications aside, there is a whole range of techniques for direct probe injection into your animal model system. And uh, this set of protocols basically can be categorized in terms of the uh, taxis or directedness of the probe and the structure of the probe. Now, starting off with the, the simplest first are small organic fluorescent dyes. The use of near infrared fluorescent dyes is particularly advantageous, and I'll explain that when we discuss the effect of the emitted wavelength on tissue penetration. Now, among the fluorophore dyes that are available, a popular group are the cyanide dyes, such as Psi 5.5 and Psi 7.0, and the endocyanine green dye, ICG, shown below. A footnote here of interest is that the wavelength of light emitted by this class of uh, probe is affected by the linker polymethylene chain in the molecule. The longer the polymethylene chain, the longer the wavelength of light emitted. Now, a more general aspect of small organic fluorescent dyes is that even though they are not structured to be directed towards any particular target molecule or cell line, they in fact can act in a directed fashion in oncology models. And this is specifically due to what is known as the EPR effect or the enhanced permeability and retention effect due to the abnormal an angiogenesis in tumor cell masses. Quantum dots are another class of fluorescent probes and they have a set of unique features that allow them to be used in very particular ways when it comes to in vivo optical imaging. The core of most quantum dots is of a semiconductor material. And that core will be coated uh, with a material that allows for chemical conjugation for specific ligands to allow for directedness of the quantum dot to a particular antigenic site inside your mouse model. Their size range tends to be between two and eight nanometer in diameter. They're quite small. And they have a high quantum yield. Their emitted to absorb photon ratio is quite high, and they tend to be quite bright. Now, they have a set of additional features that facilitate their use in a version of multiplexing, where multiplexing in a general sense is simply the use of multiple probes, each producing specific emit emission wavelengths of light that can be separately collected. Now, what are these features in quantum dots that facilitate multiplexing? Well, they have narrow emission spectra, and they have large stoke shifts. In other words, good separation between their peak excitation or uh, absorption wavelength and their emission wavelength. This allows for narrow band pass filters to collect a high percentage of the light emitted by quantum dots. Now, finally, the emission peak of a quantum dot is going to be positively correlated with the diameter of the quantum dot. So the broader the quantum dot diameter, the longer the wavelength of light emitted by that particular quantum dot. Interestingly, the peak absorption or excitation of that quantum dot is not affected by diameter. So how are these sets of features used for multiplexing in in vivo optical imaging? Well, imagine, if you will, that you had multiple populations of quantum dots of different sizes, each respectively conjugated to a specific ligand that would go to a specific antigenic site within your mouse model. Now, once all of those quantum dots are injected, a single excitation event will excite all of those quantum dots in their respective locations, and the emission wavelength will be distinct for each of those locations courtesy of the diameter of the quantum dot in that location. So using a set of uh, emission uh, bandpass filters, you can collect each of the emitted wavelengths of light from each of the quantum dot populations, and then superimpose all of those separate data onto a final image. This is multiplexing quantum dot style. Now, while 
quantum dots are a particular type of target-directed probe. I'd like to revisit the idea of a target-directed probe in a more general sense, because most of them are constructed out of small molecular ligands that are tethered to a floor form. And this construct, once injected, will bind to the anagenic site that the ligand is specific for. Now, there are many uh, examples of this that are available and commercialized um, and available to you in the market. I've included three particular examples here just by way of clarifying uh, their utility. So in the cases of oncology models, you can, as a for instance, uh, acquire a anti-PSA immunoglobulin 404 conjugate that will bind specifically to prostate tumor cells. Now in the case of wanting to evaluate activated macrophages, you can uh, use an antifolate immunoglobulin fluorophore that will bind specifically to the fluorophore receptors, which are expressed at an elevated level in macrophages. And finally, in cases of apoptosis in dead and dying cells, you can use an exon 5, which will bind specifically to the phosphatidylserine uh, moieties that are exposed in dead and dying cells. Now, another class of FLI probe is the activatable probe. It literally is turned on by the activity of specific enzymes. Now, how does this happen? Well, the activatable probe is not going to emit fluorescence in its intact state. And this is because the, uh, the fluorochromes or fluorophores are positioned in very close proximity one to the other um, by the overall structure of the probe conjugate so that the light emitted by one following excitation is immediately absorbed by the other um, as the stoke shift is not large and emitted light from one will be used as excitation light by the other. And no light, in effect, is emitted beyond the probe. Now, this changes in the presence of the enzyme that is specifically able to cleave the, the linker moiety here. And the linker moiety will be constructed so that it contains the substrate of the enzyme of interest. So when the enzyme is present and cleaves its substrate, the two uh, fluorophores will separate one from the other, quenching will stop. If excitation light is applied, fluorescence will happen. What we have here is a very simple example of this, where you have ectopic subcutaneous tumors that have been uh, transduced to express GFP constitutively, and now, with an activatable probe, ProSense 750, one can detect the inf host inflammatory response to these tumors by monitoring the lysosomal catspin protease concentration around uh, those ectopic uh, tumors. And the <coughs> signal that's given by the uh, ProSense 750 will uh, be captured and can be separately added uh, in a layered fashion to the uh, GFP signal, thus showing via co-registration the co-localization of the host inflammatory response to the presence of the tumor. Now, one final example of a kind of FLI probe uh, that can be used is out there. And it's really sort of a combination of uh, two classes of probes that we've already discussed. What we're going to uh, look at here is quantum dots that are self-illuminating, or quantum dot uh, BRET, where BRET is bioluminescence resonance energy transfer. So briefly, what we have in this scenario is a quantum dot that's been ligated to a series of luciferase enzymes. And in this particular example, we're looking at uh, LUC8. Okay? And the luciferase enzyme in the presence of substrate, of course, will generate light. LUC8 generates a blue light that doesn't get very far, but it does serve the function of exciting the quantum dot. And in fact, none of the LUC8 uh, light makes it out beyond the quantum dot. It's all taken in by the quantum dot and uh, will be used to excite the quantum dot to emit its much longer uh, wavelength of emitted light. Now, the advantage here is twofold. One is there is no longer a requirement for excitation light for the quantum dot.
from an exogenous source. And exogenous source excitation light invariably leads to an elevated background in, uh, in vivo optical imaging. So it's nice to get rid of that. Secondarily, the longer wavelength light from the quantum dot for emitted light can travel through tissue with greater success. And I'll explain the details of that momentarily. But what that does is that allows you to have low background, um, non-specific excitation light in that you're using the luciferase as your light source for activating the quantum dot. And you're able to get good tissue penetration by the quantum dot. Now, imagine, if you will, as we previously discussed, you want to do multiplexing. So you can add a conjugated moiety here, a ligand, that will bind to a specific site. And you can do this on a per quantum dot uh, diameter population with the possibility of using two or three different uh, sizes of quantum dots. And given their narrow spectra and good separation, you can basically use a luciferase instigated multiple uh, quantum dot population, excitation, light production, and then light capture by your imager. And this is a beautiful way to basically have very low background multiplexing through the use of BRET. All right. So now we're going to transition and discuss the various key unique advantages to in vivo optical imaging. Top of the list is the fact that optical imaging is incredibly sensitive. Uh, there are devices out there, and I include the ones from SI Imaging, that have very, very high sensitivities. Ours, in fact, are really at the cutting edge of the uh, sensitivities that are available on the market getting down to 45 photons per second per centimeter squared per steradian. And this can translate to very low copy number of luciferase enzymes and uh, fluorophores that need to be injected in order to get detection. Now, there are other very um, highly resolving modalities of imaging out there. Micro-CT and MRI are among them. And these are very good at resolving cellular level structures. However, when one initiates a model system in which you've injected cells, it may take weeks to get to the point where you're looking at cellular level structures that are of a size that can be resolved by either micro-CT or MRI. So with high sensitivity comes early onset detection. And let me just present an example experiment to demonstrate this point. What you can see off to the left here is again, our athymic uh, nude mice uh, that have been challenged with the A549 cells shown previously. And again, they're lodged in the capillary bed of the pulmonary space. And following uh, luciferin injection, you can very nicely see the light emitted uh, courtesy of luciferase activity. Now, this happened as early as two hours post-injection. And these mice were followed out, out to nine weeks. And the signal, of course, just continues to get brighter. Now, if you look retrospectively at MRI and micro-CT, you can certainly see the nice peripulmonary uh, lesions of tumor mass development along the edge of the uh, lung lobe here at nine weeks, both in the MRI and in the micro-CT. And if you work your way backwards, uh, you can see it at seven weeks and at six weeks, not quite so clearly, but it's definitely there. And by four weeks, it's really quite hard to discern. So what we're looking at with regard to onset of detection for MRI and micro-CT is somewhere north of four weeks, somewhere long within four weeks. By comparison, optical was detecting uh, this tumor cell population as early as two hours post-injection. So how do you make use of this early onset detection? Well, it's obviously very useful for screening, right? You can screen your uh, mice that have been injected, and you can determine which mice have been effectively challenged and which have not. And so as a uh, basic rule of thumb for a lot of um, animal model system developments, it's always very nice to have an optical component that would allow you to screen your mice um, early on so that you know that you have what you need. 
Now, beyond uh, being highly sensitive and serving as a screening modality, optical is great in the sense that it is fast. The real-time data acquisition for optical data takes something on the order of seconds, somewhere typically between 5 and 20, 25 seconds. By comparison, when you're doing PET spec um, imaging, you're looking at at least minutes, if not the better part of a uh, half hour. And the uh, MRI acquisitions can be the better part of an hour. So optical is fast. And beyond being fast, it has large FOV. This makes it um, truly a high throughput imaging modality. It is fast and with a large FOV, allowing you to image as many as five to 10 miles at a time, you're able to create basically a data set of high N rather easily, leading to strong statistical data and in effect, better science. Now, there are a couple last key advantages to optical imaging that I'd like to go over. The first being non-invasive imaging. What do I mean by that? When you're acquiring your data, you don't need to sacrifice the animal at intermediate time points. You essentially can follow the same cohort of animals over time by non-invasively imaging the optical data that is penetrating through their tissue and being collected by your camera system. So what does this do? Well, obviously, first of all, it leads to the use of fewer animals, which is always a good thing. But secondarily, it also allows for a single cohort of animals to be followed over time. And as a result, you don't have intergroup variability that would have happened in more traditional constructs where you were sacrificing uh, replicate groups of animals at various intermediate time points to collect data. By using a single cohort of animals, all of this intergroup variability is gone. And you have statistical, statistically tighter data, which makes for better science. Now, finally, there is the fact that with the large field of view of optical imaging, you're able to do whole animal imaging. And what does this give you? Well, it gives you the capacity to comprehensively monitor disease progression and the system, systemic distribution of uh, therapeutics throughout the animal system. That exhaustive capability of optical imaging is very valuable when you're wanting to look at the true um, distribution of any pathogen and the real biodistribution uh, measured optically, the PKPD, of the therapeutic that you're trying to evaluate. What we have here off to the left is an example study where the investigators did their due diligence in looking at the biodistribution of uh, FLI probe both in vivo and importantly, ex vivo at the end of study at necropsy. And let me explain the value of that. So first of all, um, the science here is a little bit cool in that we're looking at a colorectal cancer ectopically placed here subcutaneously. And the probe that was used, the fluorescent probe that uh, was used was a conjugate probe in which it was directed by a aphibody specific for the colorectal cancer um, uh, cell surface, and uh, an IR700 fluorescent dye that did double duty, both as a fluorophore and as a therapeutic, specifically a photosynthesizer molecule that would uh, instigate photodynamic therapy of the colorectal cancer, which is essentially the production of radical oxygen intermediates that could kill uh, uh, the functionality of the cell. Uh, if in close proximity. Now, science uh, and application aside, what these investigators did is they demonstrated in the in vivo construct that there was apparently high specificity of the probe conjugate for the colorectal cancer. They went one step further and did necropsy at the end of study. This was an early pilot study. And they showed that indeed, amongst all the major organs harvested, the probe conjugate specifically and with uh, much higher concentration bound to the, uh, uh, the colorectal cancer tumor of interest, um, and much less so to all the other organs uh, tested, with the exception, of course, being the liver. And I say, of course, in that uh, any large foreign protein will get screened and captured by the liver in process. So the 
the, the takeaway here is that it is always good to go ahead and do a necropsy evaluation of major organ distribution of your probe early on in your study so that you can validate that, in fact, the apparent biodistribution that you see in vivo is, uh, in effect, um, the real biodistribution that you would get by the uh, very sensitive uh, necropsy ex vivo analysis of the major organs. So this is sort of a lead-in to the limitations of optical in vivo imaging in that um, there is a, a primary limitation to optical, and it is in the form of uh, tissue penetration. Uh, the ability of light to go into uh, tissue is limited by a variety of factors. And I'll get into that momentarily. But first, I want to pay passing homage to all the imaging modalities that are out there. Of course, any preclinical investigator is going to uh, play with multiple toys, if you will. There's not simply optical imaging out there to work with. We have MRI, micro CT, SPECT, PET, and ultrasound for starters. And all of these imaging modalities are complementary in that uh, they all have their unique strengths and all have their specific disadvantages or weaknesses. And as I just mentioned, the primary um, shortcoming to optical is the ability of light to penetrate tissue. So what happens to light when it comes into tissue? Well, it can get absorbed, it can get scattered, it can even reflect off the surface of the tissue and never make it to the probe. So what are the primary mechanisms that are at play here? Well, absorption is primarily gonna happen courtesy of blood hemoglobin or, or tissue pigment in the form of melanin. The good news here is that <coughs> the extent of absorption by blood hemoglobin and melanin is not a constant. In fact, it's a, wave, it's, it's a function of the wavelength of the light uh, that is attempting to pass through the tissue. With lower wavelength light in the blue and the green, 300 to 500 nanometer in length, being strongly absorbed by blood hemoglobin and melanin. But as the wavelengths of light get longer, this absorption declines to the point where in the near infrared, starting at around 700 nanometer, the absorption by blood hemoglobin and melanin is at a minimum. This region of the optical spectrum for optical imaging purposes is referred to as the optical window in that tissue is behaving as, relatively speaking, as a window here in that it is not absorbing strongly um, the, the light impinging upon it. What does this mean to the optical imager? Basically, it means that the wavelength of light that you use will strongly affect the sensitivity of your ability to detect the probe that you use. Now, the probe is uh, the, the egg and the chicken and the egg story here in that how you select your probe is vital. If you select a probe that requires you to use blue light, you can see that you will not detect any probe that is lower than uh, a half millimeter from the surface. If you use a probe that requires green excitation light, well, you can have that probe lodged in a situation that is slightly uh, further away from uh, tissue surface, but not much. We're looking at basically one and a half millimeters. And if you use a probe uh, that is excited by red light, you can go down to five millimeters. Whereas if you use a probe that's excited by near infrared light, you really have a whole centimeter of tissue to play with. And given that the mouse is only two centimeters deep from either side, you can effectively monitor any uh, biodistribution of probe in a mouse body. So this is the advantage of using probes that are excited by longer wavelengths of light. And this is primarily how you work around tissue penetration or signal light signal attenuation courtesy of tissue. Now, bioluminescence, the production of photons courtesy of enzymes, of course, is also going to be attenuated by tissue. Photons are photons and tissue is tissue. And you're going to get attenuation of bioluminescence photons that are in the blue, uh, in the green, in the blue, in the green region of the optical spectrum, courtesy, again, of blood hemoglobin. So investigators um, 
and producers of novel uh, enzyme systems for bioluminescence have uh, really focused on getting the emitted light to be more red shifted. And this is what you get when you use uh, click beetle red and firefire fire luciferase as your luciferase enzymes. You get uh, light that's produced in uh, the low to middle uh, 600s, which has the ability of escaping any of the absorption that would happen courtesy of blood hemoglobin, and therefore your sensitivity for any cells that are expressing this wavelength of light is that much higher. Now, just to drive this point home in general terms, um, here's an example of a naive mouse. And it's been splayed open, and then uh, it, in, in terms of fluorescence, it's been excited with either blue, green, or near-infrared light. And you can see that with blue excitation light, which is what green fluorescent proteins use to emit green light, um, you get all this autofluorescence from the skin, the gut, and the bladder that have nothing to do with any probe whatsoever. There is no probe in this mouse. This is all autofluorescence. Now, when you use green light for the purpose of exciting a red fluorescent protein, which is what the red fluorescent proteins emit, um, you have lower level intensity of a skin autofluorescence and gut autofluorescence, but it's still there. By contrast, when you would uh, use a near-infrared probe that would require near-infrared excitation light, you see nothing. And that's exactly the way you want it. You do not want to see the mouse. You want to see your probe. And if your probe gets excited and emits in the near-infrared, it will shine out to your camera system like a beacon. Of course, with any uh, probe, there are going to be additional uh, parameters of interest, such as quantum yield, in vivo stability, pharmacokinetics, and photobleaching, and all of these need to be optimized as well. Now, one final note on ways in which one can improve the performance of your probe uh, beyond selecting of the uh, wavelength of light used, you can um, modify your animal handling techniques. What does this involve? Basically, if and whenever possible, you can use uh, animal strains that are white or hairless, it's strongly recommended to do so. Um, for instance, if you can go from a black, C5, uh, a black C57B6 mouse to a white valve C uh, mouse or to a nude mouse, then you avoid the absorption um, phenomena of black fur and black skin, and you will have greater tissue penetration and shorter exposure times of your excitation and your emitted light. Um, additionally, or separately, you can go ahead and do hair removal of the uh, fur on a mouse. And you can also do narrowing, which is an exfoliation, uh, a depilation, if you will, of the uh, mouse hair. And that's long lasting, long lasting in shaving, and will allow you to avoid the uh, absorption of either uh, excitation or emitted light in your mouse model system. And finally, you can do uh, in situ imaging if you must, which is the way of just basically pulling back the skin and seeing your light foci without the interference of uh, uh, epidermal and dermal, and dermal skin attenuation. What we're looking at in this particular model is a viral foot pad infection in which lymphocytes have been transduced to express luciferase and can be seen presenting at various peripheral lymph nodes around the mouse's body. Now, in the final section of today's presentation, I'm going to take a moment and present some of the diverse ways in which in vivo optical imaging has been applied to the preclinical research work of our uh, investigator user base. Now, typically, when one thinks of in vivo optical imaging being applied to preclinical research, one envisions an image such as this, where you have optical data being superimposed onto the white light image of a mouse or rat or onto the x-ray of a mouse or rat for the purposes of orientating the uh, location of that optical data. It should be emphasized, however, that there are many other animal model systems and constructs by which in vivo optical imaging can be applied to great use. My general rule of thought is that if you have a point source of light that emits from a centimeter or less from the surface of tissue, and you can get the object into the imager, well, then you have 
a model. And so here's a sampling of some of the many non-mouse model systems in which optical imaging can be applied. We're looking at transduced zebrafish here, as well as caterpillars that are transduced to express a renalin luciferase. You can have any number of bacterial cell lines that have been transfected to express a fluorophore. We also have many investigators that before going in vivo will evaluate their cell line or their nanoparticle construct that uh, expresses uh, bioluminescence or fluorescence light in an in vitro context to make sure that the uh, amount of light being generated is going to be adequate for their purposes when going in vivo. It also provides them the opportunity to evaluate dose levels before going into an in vivo context. Now, there are investigators that are focusing on agrarian questions that will go ahead and make use of in vivo optical imaging as well. And what we're looking at here is the use of optical imaging to evaluate pathogen burden on produce going to market, literally, and the uh, appropriateness of various different techniques to reduce this bacterial load. And be it cantaloupe or chicken wing, the results of this kind of work can be critical in setting up the appropriate treatment of produce in the process of harvesting and handling before it goes to market. Now, in the top right-hand corner, left-hand corner, what we're looking at here is an example of Sherenkov imaging. And first, a bit of science. So Sherenkov imaging basically deals with the use of high energy positrons that are being emitted by radionuclide. So think of PET imaging. And so if you have a PET radionuclide being used in your mouse model system, you can monitor and detect its biodistribution by using optical as a preliminary evaluation of your PET model. So how does it work? Basically, you have the positrons that are emitted by the radionuclide interacting with tissue electrons. And these electrons and positrons come together in an annihilation event. And from that are high energy photons that are generated. These high energy photons are traveling at speeds greater than visible light through the tissue. And as such, they leave a wave of blue light. Now, this is uh, a surface biased application, as we know, because blue light does not travel far through tissue. That being said, there are a variety of applications for which Sherenkov imaging has its, its purpose. Now, finally, what we're looking at down here is simply the use of our sister imaging modality, the X-ray, for the purposes of evaluating the details of the structure of certain materials of interest to investigators. So this is uh, an application that uh, some of our investigators use when they make use of our imaging systems. So from amongst all of the many uh, applications that uh, have been uh, testimony to in uh, literature surveys, uh, we're going to go ahead and just present some of the more common and uh, highly valued applications of in vivo optical imaging when it comes to small animal preclinical research. And it should be mentioned that all of the papers that are presented here are peer-reviewed publications, and all the investigators are folks that are making use of SI imaging devices, either an AMEHT or a LAGO imaging system. Now, in this uh, initial sample of a publication image, we're looking at the central, most commonly used uh, aspect of in vivo optical imaging when it comes to preclinical imaging research, and that is the early onset detection through high sensitivity monitoring of the cells of interest. In this particular case, we have a Wister rat that has been intracranially injected with glioblastoma cells to be studied for their sensitivity to therapy. And uh, they've already been transduced to express luciferase. And you can see from as early as day eight onward, the cells are detectable. And as the cells grow, the image here would suggest that 
the cells are growing out to day 20 as the signal increases in intensity. Now in this second study, which is looking at the ability to regulate the occurrence of metastatic lesions from a primary tumor, the investigators essentially wanted to be able to monitor with their optical in vivo imaging the occurrence and growth of the primary uh, tumor site followed by any incident metastatic lesion. And that was achieved here. What you can see at week one through week four in this particular mouse is the growth of the primary orthotopic breast tumor mass as indicated by increase in signal intensity. And then on week four and a half, there was the occurrence of a metastatic lesion in the pulmonary space of this mouse. I've gone ahead and included some of the uh, efficacy data from this study. They used a range of T-cell therapies for this uh, control of the breast tumor mass, along with doxyrubicin. The, the essential point that I'd like to make here is that in monitoring efficacy, they used mean tumor volume, which is fine and traditional, but they very easily could have gone ahead and start evaluating the overall efficacy of the different treatment paradigms by looking at overall whole mouse signal intensity. Now, the interesting aspect of this next study is that the investigators structured their experiment to assess the possibility of conducting the following clinical protocol. Would it be possible to label a glioblastoma tumor mass with a fluorophore reporter such that at the time of surgery, at the surgical site, the surgeon could use an excitation light to light up the glioblastoma tumor mass, courtesy of the fluorophore reporter that was directly bound to it. Now, as a preliminary criterion, the investigators realized that they would have to be able to successfully deliver this fluorophore to the brain space across the blood-brain barrier. So they went ahead and developed a particular micelle nanoparticle construct that was designed to do just this. And by way of a preliminary setup, they went ahead and challenged the test mice with a human glioblastoma cell line that had already been transduced with luciferase. And so it would give a bioluminescent signal. And using the bioluminescent signal, they monitored the intensity of that to the point where they believed that there was an adequate glioblastoma cell mass. And you can see that point in time right here. The investigators then went ahead and used a four nanometer, a four nanomole quantity of the fluorophore loaded micelle structure illustrated here and introduced it into the mice via tail, tail vein injection. Now, 24 hours post challenge with the uh, micelle, the loaded micelle nanoparticle construct the investigators went ahead and imaged both the control mouse, which had no glioblastoma, and the four test mice that did. And sure enough, what you can see here is that there is above background signal of the near infrared fluorophore in the brain space of the four test mice, certainly of the three middle ones. And what the investigators did is they followed this over a 96 hour time course and saw a persistence of this elevated signal in the brain space area of all four of the test mice at the 96 hour time point. What I really like about this study, however, is that they went ahead and did one additional thing, which was to go ahead and evaluate not only the in vivo by distribution as indicated by fluorophore signal, but to do a end of study necropsy and look at the by distribution across all the major organs of interest. And sure enough, here, with the absence of tissue attenuation, in the ex vivo evaluation, they saw again that there was elevated signal in the brain of the test mass demonstrated here. And by comparison, the brains of the four test mice versus the control mass were notably brighter in fluorescent intensity, again, indicating that not only did the um, nanoparticle direct delivery to the brain space, but because of the glioblastoma presence in the brain, that persistence of the near-infrared fluorophore signal in the brain was due to the glioblastoma. 
Now, in this next study, the investigators really want to accomplish two things. They wanted to be able to demonstrate that they could effectively detect the bone metastatic lesions of a breast tumor cell line. And secondly, they wanted to be able to evaluate whether or not their uh, new novel uh, polyclonal antibody against the uh, CSF1 cytokine CSF1 receptor complex, which is known to promote unregulated cell growth within the breast tumor cell line, if that antibody uh, applied to the mice in vivo could effectively suppress the development of bone metastatic lesions of this breast tumor cell line. So they evaluated three different treatment paradigms uh, to determine whether or not, one, they could see the breast tumors um, in their metastatic uh, foci in uh, the bone, and two, to see if there was any specific reduction courtesy of the uh, polyclonal antibody against the CSF1 cytokine receptor complex. And what you can see here is in the no treatment group out to day 31, there's a very nice progression of the uh, formation of bone metastatic lesions after intracardiac uh, challenge of the breast tumor cell line uh, to the tune of uh, 100,000 cells. And <clears throat> this is a standard way of initiating the uh, metastatic lesion phenomena of primary breast tumor cells. And uh, in the control antibody setup, you can see that there's a similar progression of bone metastatic lesion formation uh, it starts a bit later, but it's definitely there by day 31. And in the test mice, which were given the specific polyclonal against the CSF1 cytokine and receptor complex, you can see a variable outcome where the bone mets are formed in one mouse out at day 28 and day 30, but are really um, uh, not seen at all in the, uh, some of the mice. Um, and one presented here being mouse number two, where there was no metastatic lesion uh, formation out to day 31. So in summary, this is a success in two ways. One in that you see the ability to detect, detect uh, metastatic lesions in the bone microenvironment quite nicely. And secondarily, you uh, see the moderate effect of the novel therapeutic in the ability to reduce the instance of metastatic lesion formation. Now, to further evaluate the precise location and extent of bone loss in the various different test group of mice, the investigators went ahead and made use of micro-CT. And what we can see here in one of the control mice at the point where optical data indicated a metastatic lesion there is progressive bone loss over the time course of the study in the head region of the tibia close to the knee joint region. And in a more uh, comprehensive evaluation of bone loss in the various mouse treatment groups, what the investigators observed was that for those mice that were given either no treatment or simply control antibody, there was indeed progressive bone loss in the femur or tibia bones close to the knee joint region. And by contrast, those mice that had been given the test antibody against the CSF1 cytokine receptor complex experienced no observable bone loss by micro-CT. So the general imaging application takeaway message here is that optical and micro-CT can function as complementary imaging modalities where optical functions as a high sensitivity, rapid screening imaging modality for the purposes of detecting the cells of interest, in this case, the metastatic breast cells in the bone space of mice. Micro-CT can be used as a follow-up high resolution imaging modality for the purposes of the exact characterization of the bone loss associated with these metastatic lesions. Now, finally, I should mention that SI imaging facilitates this complementary use of optical and micro-CT imaging through a commercial collaboration that we have with a company called Molecubes Inc., which makes a benchtop micro-CT unit. They make spec and PET as well. And we provide a universal animal bed that allows our LAGO imaging system users to do optical imaging in the LAGO and then transfer the animals to the Molecubes CT unit for further CT imaging. 
So in this next study, the investigators successfully used non-invasive in vivo optical imaging to demonstrate the relative efficacies of different drug treatment paradigms against their disease model of interest. Now, what were they studying? They were looking into the treatment of a particularly aggressive form of T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia that had been observed to express elevated quantities of PIM protein kinases. So they developed a PAM-PIM protein kinase inhibitor in the form of AZD. And they went ahead and evaluated here its in vivo efficacy. So briefly, the treatment was to take 200,000 cells of this particular strain of T cells known to express elevated PIM protein kinases that had already been previously transduced with luciferase, inject them via tail vein, wait for three days, and then proceed to treat them. The 20 mice that were so challenged were randomly uh, grouped into four different treatment groups and were either given simply vehicle on day three, AZD at 30 mg per kg, pontinib. Pontinib is another known multiple protein kinase inhibitor that they thought that they would evaluate in relative efficacy terms to their new test uh, therapeutic, AZD. And they did combinatorial therapy as well. So in evaluating the relevant intensities on a whole mouse basis of these mice in the different treatment groups, it became quite evident that there was some marginal reduction by AZD, again, some additional uh, further reduction by pontinib, but by far the greatest reduction by the combinatorial therapy of both AZD and pontinib given together. And this is demonstrated graphically here. So one of the nice aspects about this paper was that the investigators didn't stop with the initial efficacy results. They went one step further. What they did is evaluated the efficacy of the same drug treatment paradigms against an engrafted model in which drug therapy didn't start until 14 days after challenge instead of the initial three days. So what did they see? Well, after 21 days of therapy, on day 35 of the experiment, they saw analogous results where the vehicle mice were heavily burdened with uh, leukemia. The AZD treated mice marginally less so, and the pontinib mice even more so um, reduced. But again, it was the combinatorial therapy of the AZD and the pontinib together where they saw truly a significant reduction in the overall leukemia burden in the mice. The unfortunate news here is that none of the mice survived. There was an extended lifespan for the AZD pontinib treated mice, but they too had uh, premature death. The takeaway here from this study is that through the use of non-invasive in vivo optical imaging, the investigators were able to clearly discern differences in levels of efficacy by the different drug treatment paradigms tested. In the final application study to be presented here today is an example of virally mediated oncogenesis, where the investigators use a luciferase optical reporter to monitor the extent of the tumor progression in their mouse model system. So what exactly did the investigators do here? Well, they wanted to induce the formation of a soft tissue sarcoma, and they used a lysogenic viral particle construct to do this. Specifically, they used adenoviral Cree recombinase that had been modified to express interrupter sequences, if you will, that would prevent the effective transcription of two important growth regulatory proteins, TERP53 and P10. This adenoviral uh, particle also expressed the luciferase gene so that any kind of successful transduction of the muscle cells by the viral particle would be monitored through the light reporter function of luciferase. A secondary aspect of this study was to determine the best route of challenge to successfully generate the desired sarcoma. And what the investigators found out by testing either a subcutaneous or intramuscular challenge uh, is that both routes were equally effective in generating sarcoma as observed by the reporter function of luciferase at week 17. So the essential takeaway from this model is that it is readily possible to go ahead and 
induce cancers of interest in mouse model systems using viral, uh, virally mediated uh, oncogenesis techniques. And furthermore, that this process can be monitored through the use of luciferase as an optical reporter. So this concludes today's seminar, where we have the opportunity to discuss the essential scientific principles that are behind preclinical in vivo optical imaging, and also where we've had the opportunity to present and discuss some of the diverse imaging applications of in vivo optical imaging in its support of preclinical research. I want to thank you for your attention. And I want to pay passing homage and thanks to our international customer base. And finally, please know if you have any questions on the material that was presented here today, you can reach out to me directly. My email is here in the bottom right hand corner. I would also strongly recommend that you check out our spectralinvivo.com webpage. It is full of information beyond our investigator publication database. We have lots of information on the image stations that SI Imaging manufactures here in the US, the Amy HTX and the Lago system, as well as the Kino system. And finally, if you are interested in having a live presentation that would review the technical details of these image stations, please know that you can contact either myself directly or our global sales and marketing manager, Melanie Petras, and we will arrange for such a seminar for you. I wanna thank you again for your attention, and here's to good in vivo optical imaging.